Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Okay, I'm gonna run this keynote. Everything cool? Okay, hi everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Claire, obviously, and I'm so honored and excited to be here with you this afternoon or this morning or this evening or whenever it is, wherever it is that you're watching this. Uh, I'm sad I can't be here in person, uh, but I think there's something very appropriate on some level about a keen about the history of women in computing being given by a woman inside a computer, quite literally. So perhaps everything happens for a reason. I want to preface this by saying first that this talk is sort of coming from uh, from outside of the world of APIs and will be a little bit more general uh, in terms of a history of women in technology and in computing. But I hope that you will find a lot to draw from in my emphasis on users, on building and designing for users, on community, and on making meaningful connections from data. Because uh, for me, that's that's what it's all about. Uh, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a coder, I'm not a developer, I'm a journalist and a, what do you call me, a rock star artist. But um, I do have some bona fides. Uh, for one, my father worked for Intel for most of his life. And when I was a kid, we always had computers in the home. Um, I never thought of the computer as being something that was you know, for boys or for girls any more than I thought the toaster or the television was for boys or for girls. And as proof, here's a video of me at a very young age, beating the CD-ROM game Myst, which I was very obsessed with and made my father film me beat. Uh, I share this because I want to share the fact that when I was a kid, I always felt that the computer was an extension of myself. It was part of my identity. It was part of who I was. It was my home. And when the web came along, like everyone else in my generation, I immediately felt the same way about it. I felt that it was a place of discovery and connection and community and, and learning. But something happened <laughs> between the time that this video was taken and the moment that I sit here now. Something happened to me, something happened to the web, that's for sure. Many things happened to the web. For one, it stopped feeling like an extension of myself. It stopped feeling safe. It stopped feeling fun uh, to me as a person and more importantly, perhaps as a woman. So a few years ago, I started to ask myself, what happened and when? I looked at the past. I always looked at the past. And I talked to a lot of older women about their experiences in the early computing industry and on the first waves of the web and before that, the internet. And in finding these women and talking to them, I found a lineage uh, that could include someone like me. And I found a version of the established tech history that gives us all you know, amazing tech mothers and grandmothers to emulate. But I think more importantly, I found something else, which was the seeds of a different future. And by that I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I found myself researching a technology or an approach to technology that just had it been implemented early enough or at scale or had it been funded might have led us to an entirely different world today. So the women that I encountered writing my book, Broadband, two of which I will tell you about today, uh, they're not just role models, they're something deeper. They're these sort of latent hidden possibilities within our own past, possibilities that we can learn from and apply today. Let me give you an example of what I mean. This is uh, Stacy Horn. She started an online community in 1989. Now, those days before the web, of course, online didn't mean the web, it usually meant a bulletin board system or a BBS, which was a text window that you called the phone and paid for by the hour, kind of like a message board. Now, Stacy had been devoted to this very popular BBS on the West Coast called The Well, but she was a New Yorker. And you know, for those of you who don't know the difference between the East and West Coast of the US, it's a very big cultural divide. Stacy always felt very much out of place uh, on the West Coast internet. She didn't want to talk about computers, really. She wanted to talk about art and film, and she felt really disconnected from the kind of cyber hippie culture that was emerging in the Bay Area. So when she started her own online community. She called it Echo, the East Coast Hangout. And she hosted Echo, you know, not in a garage in Palo Alto or in some accelerator funded by big tech telecom money. She hosted it out of her apartment in Greenwich Village on a stack of modems surrounded by toy figurines and paperwork and pictures of friends. Now this advertisement gives you a sense of the culture of Echo. It was very Gen X, very snarky, intellectual. And it was populated by writers and artists and members of the New York media. It wasn't about computer culture. It was culture 
supported by computers. But there's something else really interesting about Echo that makes it an outlier from its time. Now, in those days, in the late 80s, early 90s, women made up only a very, very small percentage of the online population. We think maybe 10, 15 percent, and all good numbers on that. But using a female identity in early social spaces, places like BBSs and listservs and multi-user domains, it often led to, if not immediate harassment, then just immediate attention. And so a lot of female users would use male aliases or gender neutral sounding pseudonyms so that they could just experience online culture without being bothered, which was great because then gender play was a big part of the early internet and it do all kinds of experimentation that was ultimately very positive. But one consequence of that was that women had a really hard time finding one another online. It was just difficult for women to find one another. Now, unless they were on Echo, because Echo was 40% female. And this made it one of the earliest spaces online to be hospitable to women in any way. Not that Stacey created it as some kind of safe space. I mean, she was really not interested in that. In 1998, she wrote, bite me. <laughs> I didn't want more women on Echo uh, you know, to make it safe for women. I wanted to get more women on Echo to make it better. I mean, she wasn't creating a refuge or making some kind of accommodation to a vulnerable population. Stacey understood that diversity isn't a favor that you do to the underrepresented. It's an asset that serves the entire community at large. Stacey knew that women meant more perspectives, more conversation, and on an online service whose success was predicated on compelling conversations for its users, that made the whole system just much better. Now, to be fair, Stacey had all those female users because she was the only founder that was actually trying to court women. She would do things that other people in tech were doing at the time. She would recruit people from non-technical spaces. Like she would go to bars and parties and art events in New York City and just ask people who seemed interested if they had a modem. Um, she made access free for women for an entire year. If a woman left the service, she would call her on the phone personally, ask what went wrong. She created private spaces on Echo where women could talk to one another and report instances of harassment if necessary. She spoke to women's groups about the internet. She taught Unix classes out of her tiny Greenwich Village apartment so that a lack of technical knowledge would not be a limitation to new users. But main strategy for recruiting women wasn't just this boots on the ground stuff. It was actually baked into the design of the system. See, back in those days, online communities were moderated by hosts, which were users who received free access in return for the responsibility of guiding and you know, managing conversation, much like hosts at a dinner party. And we still have these kinds of moderators in some places on the internet, on Reddit, for example, but most moderation today has been outsourced to this shadow world of traumatized contract workers who have very little relationship to the communities that they're moderating, which leaves our online communities with vanishingly few tools to establish collective identity or take care of each other. Anyway, not so on Echo. In fact, every conversation on Echo, of which there were hundreds, always had two moderators, a man and a woman. When in dial into their service, oftentimes experiencing online culture for the first time, they saw themselves represented, not just in the power structure of this place, but in the culture of it. And that made it so that they would feel less inhibited and more likely to jump into the conversation rather than just lurking. Echo actually still exists. It's one of the oldest continuously operating online communities in the world. It's 30 years old because Stacy never sold, she never franchised, she never advertised. She never even indulged in the fantasy of uh, like a lucrative IPO, not even during the height of dot-com bubble hysteria. She never even made the jump to the web. In fact, this is what Echo still looks like today because when Mosaic, the first web browser came along, they see just couldn't afford to build a web interface. Why am I you about this person who created a service that um, is very much outside of time. Well, she never got rich. She's not some big famous tech billionaire. She's not um, you know, comparable to some of the other people that we lionize in the history of tech, but her accomplishments remain massive to me because she managed to do two things. She achieved gender parity on an almost completely male-dominated internet. 
because she cared enough to make that happen. And her platform has actually remained online for 30 years, surviving all the ups and downs of tech in that time, nurturing a small but very devoted family of users because she's cared enough to keep it that way. And that's a word that I feel like we don't hear enough of, care. I mean, we don't hear a lot about care in relation to online space or online services. And for a lot of people in the power centers of tech anyway, caring means caring about. It means being passionate, it means investing in a big idea, taking big risks, um, building something new with no immediate promise of success. And all of that is amazing and admirable. But what Stacy's legacy represents to me is a different kind of caring. It's, it's not just caring about something, it's caring after something, caring for something, continuing that commitment of care from the excitement of those initial moments, from the excitement of the pitch, to the much more tedious workaday, very human, very messy realities of the technology once it's been built. And this kind of work is something that our culture still very much associates with women, and in Silicon Valley at least, professional domains that are associated with this kind of work, like community management, for example. And they have a preponderance of women whose skills are not always seen as being technical skills. But the way I see it, it is a really technical skill because the software is a mechanism by which human beings facilitate tasks for other human beings at its simplest. And in order to do that effectively, you know, one has to understand the task one has to understand the mental model of the people approaching that task, the context in which they operate, and how to translate all those messy human realities of life into something functional. One has to determine whether you are solving a problem or simply creating new problems. One has to go beyond simple metrics of you know, growth and stickiness and market share and actually consider implications like mental health, and civic life, and community, and society at large. And social skills are essential in all of that. And by social skills, I don't mean you know, getting along well with people. I mean being able to see a technological object or a technological system as enmeshed and entangled within a larger social context, within a world populated by human beings. And ultimately, yeah, I mean caring about those people and what happens to them. Now, I know that something like Echo, as romantic as it is, can't realistically compete with its inheritors, but I always come back to Stacy's story because it represents for me this great lost opportunity. You know, what if the architects of our present day social media platforms actually had made the same kinds of effort at representation and inclusion and mutual respect that Stacy made? And what if those values, that approach was actually integral to how we built things rather than something tacked on after the fact, after people have already been hurt? And the thing is, not to be essential, but Stacy isn't an outlier. If you are looking like I have been zoomed out, looking for women in the history of technology, it really does help to look first where users have been cared for. And to look in those places where form gives way to function, where capital gives way to community, and where metrics give way to meaning. Let me give you another example. So this is Wendy Hall, Dame Wendy Hall, actually. She was given uh, the female equivalent of a knighthood in 2009. Uh, for her contributions to computer science. But around the time this photo was taken, she was still a lowly lecturer at the University of Southampton. And she wasn't even a computer scientist. Uh, her field was mathematics, topology. Um, she wasn't interested in computer science because she found it dry and impersonal until she discovered something called hypertext. Now, you know, we really associate hypertext with the web today. We think of it as being kind of believable with the web. But you know, hypertext is much older than the web, and since as early as the mid-1960s, it had been the study of connecting images and ideas and text together in closed computer systems through the convention of linking. Basically turning all the digitized data that computer memory was beginning to make accessible into meaningful, applicable knowledge. It's a very exciting field. And Wendy got turned on to hypertext in the mid 80s through this totally wild anachronistic British computer system called the Doomsday Project or the Doomsday Discs. Essentially, it was a countrywide effort funded by the BBC to digitally document British life, a kind of time capsule. Uh, and it was released in 1986 as two laser discs that you could navigate by pointing and clicking. Now, the discs were really ahead of their time in many ways. Uh, they included lots of multimedia material, like 
virtual walks through the British countryside, kind of early VR experiences, if you will, and images of British cities and maps and first person accounts written by school children all over the country, all indexed and easily navigable in this system. But what knocked Wendy out about the doomsday disks wasn't so much the material. I mean, she was British, she knew about England, but how it was navigated. So here you can see a little bit of what the sort of main navigation of the doomsday disks looks like, a sort of point and click CD-ROM-esque experience. Now, this is 1986. This is a long time before the World Wide Web normalized this idea of pointing and clicking through graphical interfaces. And it was hugely novel at the time to, you know, move around a screen following visual cues and this kind of geographic layout. It suddenly made all of this kind of impersonal data feel intuitive and immediate and exciting. It made it comprehensible to people who weren't in computer science departments. And combined with the emerging technology of the personal computer, Wendy realized that it actually might make all this previously inaccessible knowledge, stuff that had been locked away in databases and libraries, actually accessible to a lot of people. And that felt revolutionary, and Wendy wanted to be part of it. Now, her colleagues at Southampton told her that there was no future for her in computer science or in her department if she carried on with all this hypertext, hypermedia stuff, which they saw as being kind of soft and fluffy and not as serious as writing compilers and programming languages. But she ignored them. She actually went to the US where hypermedia was becoming more of a thing. And she dedicated her efforts to building a system that would make it possible to navigate library materials much in the way that she had navigated the doomsday disks through lots and lots of interconnected multimedia documents. She started with the archives at her university's library, but by 1989, she had built her whole entire system called Microcosm. Now, just as the World Wide Web would do some years later, Microcosm demonstrated this new, totally intuitive way of navigating information. It made information exciting and dynamic and alive and adaptable to the user. In fact, it wasn't like the web at all. And in some ways, it was better. Now, you all know this, of course, but you know, on the web, <laughs> links are contextual. They're embedded in documents, which means that when the destination of a link is taken down for whatever reason, we get a link rot. We get the 404 error. And that little piece of information that, about what connected two different ideas, that metadata, if you will, well, that's lost forever. And that's a big loss for our culture. You don't have to be an archivist or a librarian to feel that way. There's a lot of metadata that has been lost. Now, Microcosm, on the other hand, was built completely differently. It kept all the links separate in a separate database called a link base. And this link base communicated with the underlying documents without leaving a mark on them, which meant that a link in Microcosm was more like a kind of overlay over the material rather than a structural change to the material. Effectively, this meant that you could have a link that went in more than one direction. You could have a link that had multiple sources and multiple destinations. You could layer different links over the same material depending on the level of familiarity or fluency you had over the material. The system was built, in short, to encourage and facilitate learning. And it valued that really, really important piece, that nature of the connections between things, that metadata that was so essential to the design of hypertext systems at the time. It was a good thing. Now, there are actually a lot of tech systems like Wendy's in those days, in the mid to late 1980s. Um, they don't look particularly glamorous to us now, but trust, they were very important. And they came out of universities and research labs at companies like Apple and IBM, Xerox and Spolix. Interestingly, nearly every major team building hypertext systems during this time had women in senior positions, if not at the helm of the projects entirely. There's a lot of reasons for that, one of which being that hypertext as a discipline was just more open to people from different backgrounds. If you went to an early hypertext conference in the late 80s, you'd be surrounded by, yes, computer scientists, but also poets and social scientists and historians and all manner of literati. Anyone who was interested in making meaning out of data by making connections and links. It's quite open-ended as a concept. So much part of what hypertext was all about that the very first time that Tim Berners-Lee I'm sorry, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was given the male equivalent of a damehood for his contributions to computer science, 
The very first time that Sir Tim Berners-Lee presented a demo of the World Wide Web in the US at the Hypertext 1991 conference in San Antonio, almost all the scholars there thought his system was juvenile. In fact, his paper wasn't even accepted to the conference and he had to lug his $10,000 NextCube computer all the way to Texas on his own dime to demonstrate the World Wide Web on the conference floor. And people took one look at the system, if they took a look at all, and they saw the links were contextual and they only went in one direction. So what good was a hypertext system gonna be if the links could so easily break? And I will tell you a little anecdote about this photo and this moment because it is my favorite thing in the entire history of technology. So the demo period of Hypertext 1991 was held at the end of the day after all the presentations and papers had been given. It was also held at the same time as the conference's cocktail hour. And because it was Texas and because it was the summer and because it was the 90s, there was a massive margarita fountain outside. So true thing, true fact, the very first time the World Wide Web was ever being shown to anyone in the United States, to the community of scholars who you would think would be the most interested in such a thing, everybody was outside getting drunk on margaritas. In fact, if you look at this photo, which is one of the only photos of this moment, you can actually see a margarita right there, which means that that very unimpressed looking female scholar wandered in from outside with her margarita in hand to take a look at this whole World Wide Web thing. I just love it. Anyway, we know what happened with the web. In 1992, Tim Berners-Lee published the very first image to ever be clicked on a web browser, a photo of a doo-wop band called Les Horribles de Cernet, a group of female CERN employees who sang satirical songs about life at the research lab where he worked. Now, this is also kind of an aside, but I feel like I really have to share with you a small clip of a Les Horribles de Cernet music video, and hopefully the audio will work. <laughs> okay, sorry. It's incredible though, isn't it? And if you really want to see more of this, there's lots of it on YouTube. Anyway, after this, obviously, came everything else. The web became the standard. And by 1994, Tim Berners-Lee was giving the keynote at the hypertext conferences. And the more sophisticated hypertext systems, like Wendy Hall's microcosm, those became a thing of the past. There's no way for us to know now if something like microcosm, which solved so many of the web's existing problems, could have been as important to us today as the web is. Just as there's no way to know if uh, what would have happened if Echo had had the funding to make the transition to the web, what social media might look like today. But that doesn't really stop me from dreaming about it. And, that's what I mean by the different futures that these women present us with. These stories demonstrate just how many other paths have laid before us and how many other paths might still lie before us if we simply choose differently. And those paths, by the way, if you follow them long enough, they go back all the way to the beginning of the journey. I mean, computing has always been as much a woman's domain as it has been a boys club. I mean, for 200 years, computers were people, female people, female bodies and minds performing the computational labor that made the scientific age possible. And during the Second World War, when human computers were hired to operate the first mechanical computing machines, well, they became the first programmers. And because software is not yet seen as something more important than, you know, patching cables like a telephone operator or handling paperwork like a secretary or doing math like the human computer, well, this was a job that was given to women quite easily. Except, of course, operating one of these early computing machines was not simple at all because they were the first of their kind and they had no operating manuals. They had no precedent. When the mathematician Grace Hopper was first assigned to program the Mark I computer at Harvard in 1944, well, she had to quite literally reverse engineer the machine to which she'd been assigned. She had to study wiring diagrams and take the components apart until she understood its workings as well as, if not better than, the hardware engineers who had built it. Same is true. The first six women assigned to the all electronic programmable computer, the ENIAC, by the US Army. Now these women are referred to by historians today as the ENIAC six, 
although I promise they did have their own names, which I always like to say, <laughs> Kathleen McNulty, Betty Jean Jennings, Elizabeth Snyder, Marilyn Rescoff, Francis Belis, and Ruth Lichterman, the ENIAC Six. And although ENIAC Six as a moniker served to really obscure their individual contributions to the history of programming, I would say that ENIAC would make a really good name for an all-girl punk band. So if there's anyone out there that is interested in starting one, please let me know. I've already made the t-shirts. Now, in the early days, software wasn't a word, neither was programmer. And the work that these women did, they were often referred to as either coders or operators. And no one really knew what the definition of the work even was. In fact, one of the most brilliant early computer programmers, Betty Snyder, she called her job a cross between an architect and a construction engineer, which was a pretty good description of programming maybe even today. But it was through the work of women like these, defining their new roles, that programming actually became something with its own value, something separate from just the manipulation of hardware. It became a language, it became many, many languages, it became an art form. And after the Second World War, it was women who led the development of what was called at the time automatic programming, which is just the idea that programmers should be able to step above assembly code and work at a higher level of abstraction, making it possible for more people to use and access and understand computers which led to nothing less than the development of programming languages and the evolution of programming as a symbolic art. As human computers, they began to disappear around the mid-1940s, although in some domains, most importantly in aeronautics, important calculations continued to be made and checked by hand well into the 1970s, which is when NASA formally dissolved its human computing divisions, of course made famous by the book and the film Hidden Figures. But still, in the 60s, women were half of the workforce in computing, and computing was seen as women's work. This is an article from Cosmopolitan, a woman's magazine, 1967, in which Grace Hopper herself compares programming to planning a dinner party, because you have to plan ahead and schedule everything so it's ready when you need it. That's how much it was thought of as women's work, so natural for women to want to be good at planning and organizing things. That's what women always do. Now, technology historians, and this is a much larger conversation, suggest that the professionalization of the field of computing in the 1970s led to a kind of implicit masculinization, and that things like new professional and educational requirements necessary to become a software engineer in the late 60s and early 70s made it more difficult for women who were interested to get a toehold in the industry and stay there. And this seems to have set this sort of male-dominated mythology that has only reinforce itself over the years through, frankly, marketing images like these. This is an ad for the Apple II, and it's pretty clear who this product is marketed to. If you look at computer advertisements for from 1960 to, I don't know, now, you see a lot of this kind of thing. You also see this kind of thing. Products like the Honeywell Kitchen Computer, which was a pretty powerful machine for the time, but it came with a built-in cutting board and a free apron, and it was marketed to women to help them organize their recipes and their household receipts. This condescending copy was certainly not helpful for any woman interested in learning how to be a programmer. If only she can cook as well as Honeywell can compute, implying that the computer itself is more intelligent than its female user. Now, when I was growing up, it was more like images like these, <laughs> things like weird science and films where nebbish boys program their own dream women using bootleg computer equipment. And all this stuff implies that men are somehow more natural to the realm of computing and women are at best accessories to it. And that's just straight up, well, it's propaganda. It's not true. It's not true. And many of you, I'm sure, are proof. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, uh, nothing about BBS communities and hypertech systems and automatic programming. Please remember this, that if there is a boys club that dominates any sector of tech today, it's a historical anachronism. It's important to remember that in technology, in history, in life, nothing happens in a vacuum. And new technologies don't just fall from the sky. They emerge along a continuum of ideas. The World Wide Web could not have existed without decades of research into hypertext ideas conducted largely by female scholars. Social media as we experience it today could not have existed without decades of experimentation with online community building on the early internet 
on platforms long gone and a few that still survive. Tech history is so often told as a story of solitary genius with Tim Berners-Lee and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And yeah, of course those people are remarkable, but they've never been alone. They've always been surrounded by people and ideas because making things big requires big communities. And that's what's so exciting about technology and working in tech. But it's also what makes it so hard to see where things come from. And more importantly, I would argue, to see and imagine where they could have gone and could still lead. When we don't see the multiplicity of this history, we leave out a huge part of the story and we make it harder and harder for those other versions of our history to work their influence on our present world and help us to make it better. The misconceptions that we struggle with today, that technology is some kind of boys club, they took a generation to create and they will probably take another generation to fully undo, to say nothing of breaking open even further. But I believe firmly that in a technological world, technological stories are important. And if women and girls are able to see themselves reflected in the DNA of our planet's most profoundly transformative technologies, then they can see themselves more clearly in the future. Now, I write about history and the past, so I don't know much about the future, but I do know one thing for sure, and that is if we are going to survive it, uh, dare I say, if we're going to restart it, then we're going to have the help we can get. Thanks. Thank you very much, Claire. It was, it was just brilliant. Uh, the slide. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, so for the last five minutes, we, we asked you some, some questions. Uh, uh, there. Sure. So maybe I'll take the first one. Why we don't know this enough? Why we have to wait for you to write a book about it? There's a lot of different reasons. I mean, history is complicated, and sometimes understanding history requires a little bit of distance. And, you know, the technology industry is not old and we haven't had that distance really yet. We are now just beginning to understand everything that went into creating the world that we live in today. And we're beginning to live with and deal with some of the consequences of not fully understanding our history. The second thing is, I mean, I don't know about elsewhere, but in the U.S., we don't really teach the humanities in computer science programs. You know, we don't we don't teach people these histories when they're gearing up to enter this industry. It's It's not part of the curriculum, which I think is can be really, really, really detrimental. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I wish we understood it more and I think we have plenty of time to dig into it. I often think that, you know, the deeper we get into this coronavirus life, the deeper we get into climate change, I feel like the future is, is short, but the past is infinite and it will always be there to teach us something meaningful. And so you showed that the, like there's been a shift at some point, right? When uh, female were like engineers, like uh, like just engineers. And and the thing is, uh, at some point there was these ads, these weird ads, and showing that actually computers were for males. Why why this shift happens? Well, you know, it's funny. I often, I mean, I give talks about this, and people are always like, "Oh, men ruined everything. Men, men, men." But it's not really that. It's money, really. I mean the early computing industry wasn't a commercial industry and, you know, not really until the sixties that it become a, a commercial industry. Initially it was, you know, people building computing machines for the war effort. And that was much more egalitarian in a way. Um, once it became about selling and buying computers, the sort of larger forces of capitalism did their work, the work that they always do. You know, they tried to identify the market sector and, and, uh, and sell computers to those people, to the people that worked in industry, who worked in calculation intensive industries like, you know, insurance and, and you know, air travel and government. And so I think there's a confluence of a lot of factors. I don't think that there's like some giant man that was like, I'm going to turn this into a male dominated field. It was more the consequence of a lot of different factors coming into play, you know, just the gradual commercialization of the field, the fact that the first generation of female programmers was beginning to age out and maybe didn't have the resources to provide mentorship for the next generation. And the fact that, you know, the way that the computing industry developed, it was quite chaotic in the beginning and, and hardware development was uh, sort of much more well-funded and much more quickly developing than software. There was a long period of time, the software crisis in the late sixties where uh, software program, software was kind of not catching up with hardware. And a part of that was uh, a, the industry trying to uh, create a professional context for, for programmers. So it went from being this field that kind of anyone with an aptitude could get into, you know, 
you used to be able to get a job as a programmer because you were good at puzzles or because you worked your way up from being a secretary or something. I mean, there were lots of avenues, but it got to the point uh, when they were kind of trying to professionalize the field where you needed to have certain credentials, you needed to have, you know, certain educational requirements, which were more difficult for people, perhaps women, who were at home trying to raise families at the same time as pursuing careers in the 1960s. And so, you know, it became much more difficult. And that kind of semantically was marked by the shift from the word coder to the words software engineer, which kind of connote a much more sort of institutionalized uh, approach to to the industry. But well, there's lots of great scholarship on this, and I think we're, we're just beginning to understand it. I don't know if you know this quote, like, those who don't know the past, the errors of the past are condemned to repeat it. How we could repeat it for the next uh, 50 years? How we could avoid <laughs> How could avoid repeating it? Well, I mean, I think... Yeah, uh, that's, people ask me this question all the time, like, how do we fix it? And honestly, I think it just comes down to paying attention to who's really contributing. Um, you know, oftentimes history is written by those people who want to be included in the history, right? People who are willing to stand up on a table or at a podium and say, I did this, I'm important. But not everybody who's making a significant contribution is the kind of person that wants to go up at a podium and say, I'm important, write me in the history books. A lot of people are just happy doing the work. They're good team players. They're not out there with a big megaphone, you know, saying, write my name down in stone to remember forever. That's a certain personality type that wants that. So I think it's important to always recognize the contributions of people around you on your team to uh, help validate and uplift voices that are maybe a little bit quieter than the other voices in the room or uh, make sure that you know people are actually listened to and seen and to be really um, transparent about attribution and credit. And you know, I think we can all collectively write our own histories together as long as we can all play a little bit of the historian with our communities around us. Yeah, it's also probably when you succeed, you believe it's by yourself, right? Yeah, but uh, uh, you forget all the people who contributed before you. Uh, you know, this quote, like, we're just dwarves on the shoulder, shoulder of giants, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, As we yeah. Believe, we see higher and further. It's not because of our vision, but because we are elevated by them, like the, the giants before us. So, so yeah. yeah, I think it's. A, I think it would be very beneficial for us all to think more collectively than individualistically. I think, you know, in tech, especially in the U.S., there's this kind of individualistic streak of, you know, people wanting to be unicorns and, and big famous founders and billionaires. But, you know, really, we're all working together. And if we can think of success as being a collective endeavor and not something that just one person or a small amount of people can have, then we're much better off. I totally agree. And just to finish on a on a on a good note, uh, Mikwa <laughs> from the from the uh, from the um, chat is saying, "I'm watching this with my daughter. She is inspired." So thank you for inspiring. Yeah, my I love that. That makes me so happy. That's that's what I'm all. That's what I'm here for. I'm yeah. here for the daughters and the sons. More importantly, <laughs> the sons and the sons too, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure all the sons are inspired too, right? They, the only reaction we can have from your talk is to be inspired. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're really glad to have you.